Hello, my name is Miguel Nacenta, and together with Catherine Skipsey uh, from the University of Victoria, we are presenting this work, this paper, uh, titled Discourses of Cognitive Augmentation and Their Values. So this all originated because I teach a course on computing for cognitive augmentation. So what we do, just for a little bit of background, is discuss uh, different aspects of cognition, such as emotion, decision-making, many of these things. And then we discuss the technologies, specifically uh, computing technologies that support cognition in each one of those. And those go from things uh, as simple as diagramming and externalization tools to uh, more like brain-computer interaction devices and interventions of that type. Um, teaching this course has given me actually the opportunity to think quite a bit about cognitive augmentation. And one of the questions that come up for me is uh, what it is and how people talk about it, and perhaps how it is important. So this led us to a realization that technologies actually do not emerge in a vacuum. We already knew that, but um, specifically about cognitive augmentation. And what we find is that, or what we believe is that uh, how people think about augmentation technologies actually matters. And importantly, it's influenced by how augmentation is discussed by society and culture, for example, in mass media. Also quite interestingly from uh, teaching you multiple times is that it is evolving and the students think um, differently and approach the subject also um, in different ways uh, these days than at the beginning uh, when I started teaching it in 2020. So what I have been doing for quite a while now is to collect these courses and counter discourses that I see in the world, that we see in the world um, about cognitive augmentation. And those are the three main ones that um, I have been able to coalesce. These are the macro ones. They contain a lot of uh, smaller ones and the ones that I, I discuss in the paper. But it should be noted also that each one of those also has its counter discourses. The first one is what I call the techno-optimist. Uh, discourse that has its uh, base or its origins um, or perhaps its uh, serious development in uh, the 20th century. So you can here see some pictures of the um, people that are very often discussed in HCI courses such as Vannevar Bush and the Memex, Nick Leiter and Man-Computer uh, Symbiosis and uh, the augmentations of uh, Engelbart, the inventor of the mouse. Uh, but this didn't stop uh, then. What we see these days now is uh, a more um, uh, different evolutions in different directions of, of these same ideas, but that perhaps take these also in a more capitalistic uh, direction. And, and people like Elon Musk uh, go in that direction as well. So the the main idea or the main proposition of the techno-optimist uh, discourse is that the world is increasingly cognitively demanding, whereas like humans are actually not uh, necessarily changing that much. And therefore we should use uh, whichever new technologies that uh, happen to be newly available to address this demand. In the 20th century, those might have been, I don't know, cognition or even like transparency slides and microfiche and things like that um, to the internet. Uh, nowadays, it uh, seems to be going perhaps a little bit more uh, towards uh, brain computer interfaces and uh, now more recently, um, artificial intelligence or generative AI and LLMs, etc. Uh, the second topic is the, the second discourse is the embodied mind. This one is represented mostly by academics. Here I just selected uh, two books that are particularly clear to me or to us in, in this direction. Uh, one is Supersizing the Mind by the philosopher Andy Clark and the other one is Cognition in the Wild uh, by Edwin Hutchins. Uh, this discourse goes a little bit like this. It's quite academic, but says cognition is 
really not only about what happens in somebody's brain or even in a computer, but um, cognition also happens um, through and with the help and in the environment and through the objects that we use. Um, so the conclusion of these two is that cognitive augmentation actually has been going on for a very long time. And it's a natural process that almost all of us keep seeking. So, so the more modern examples would be things like computers and calculators, but um, but if you go back in the in the past, uh, you could consider numbers, reading, writing, algebra, or mnemotechnic aids also as examples of cognitive augmentation. Uh, the final example is of this course is the discourse around accessibility and disability theory. So in previous versions of, and kind of like more archaic ways of thinking about uh, disability, something that right now is referred to as the medical model of disability, augmentation seems to seek to solve the problem of people who has a disability, right? So disability as is discussed as a, as a negative thing, and uh, something that has to be uh, to be solved. But since then, uh, oh, and I should point out actually that a lot of the papers that we can find in the literature, um, not so much recently, but in like a, from 20, 30 years ago, actually take this approach very clearly. It's like we see, I, I don't know, people cannot do something, so, um, let's provide a system that actually solves or translates uh, the problem so that I can uh, do it. And sometimes in a fairly simplistic way. Um, the thinking these days has evolved quite a bit um, and there's a burgeoning field uh, has been going on for a while on critical disability theory. And this one is interesting for us to think about cognitive augmentation as well. It uh, One of the main ideas is that uh, disability is, is not static um, characteristic of the person, but more a uh, situation that the person finds themselves in. And it's also continuous. So disability is a continuum and um, at different points in time or with different circumstances or at different stages of life, we find ourselves um, in that continuum or moving in one direction or another one. So it's kind of like a relative way of expressing um, uh, ability and disability and how, how they move. And therefore, this one is useful also for us to think about technology because technology essentially acts as a prosthesis or as an intervention to shift ourselves and others in the continuum. Uh, so these are the three main discourses. And one of the main uh, things that we do at the end of the paper is I kind of try to evaluate uh, a little bit uh, how these discourses are based or not in uh, different um, human values, right? So you, we use the Swartz theory of values, the famous wheel, and we place them based on the canonical um, text that we found and uh, we've looked at. Uh, so that's more detailed in the paper and actually looking forward to discuss these and many of the things that you're going to be bringing to the workshop in just a few days. Thank you very much for your attention.